this morning's epistle reading from Ephesians 3, beginning at verse 14. Paul writes, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So far, the word of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when it comes to the matters of faith and life, we're not alone in this. And that's a good thing, since we'd mess things up if we were. You're not alone in your faith, and you're not alone in your life. And I'm not alone in my faith, and I'm not alone in my life. Now, we're not alone despite our dogged determination to try to do things on our way. We may be surrounded by family. We may be surrounded by friends. They may be mere observers, or they may be actually active partners in our adventures and misadventures. They may be helpful. They may be distractions or even detours on the road of life. But at the end of the day, we're just one person in a sea of seven billion people. And even if we could isolate ourselves from the rest of the world, adopting a hermit-like lifestyle away from other people, guess what? We still wouldn't be alone. Because either we're going to be joined in our faith and life by God, we're going to wind up despairing of the Lord's blessings because of the devil's whispers. So go sit in a cave if you want to. You're still not alone, and you won't be alone. Now there's a thought with a double edge, isn't there? I mean, how often have you felt alone? How often do you feel alone? Cigna just released a study on loneliness and isolation revealing 52% of Americans report feeling lonely, while 47% report their relationships with others as just not being very meaningful. Only 59% of Americans say they have a best friend. 12% say that they feel like they have no close friends at all. North Carolina, along with Georgia, New York, New Jersey, California, Virginia, Illinois, Michigan, Florida, and Texas, is to said to contain 57% of the lonely population of the United States. Loneliness and isolation are considered to be health hazards, thus the Cigna studies, especially as we are coming out of this pandemic. Now that would all suggest that maybe we can be alone, right? And yet people were never created to be alone. When God created Adam, he quickly realized there was a problem. It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. And of course, God created Eve from a part of Adam. People naturally gravitate away from loneliness and towards companionship. We seek relationships. We want to be around other people, even those like me who really don't like crowds. During the pandemic, people were longing to make connections with other people. Though banned and restricted from others, they made use of social media, Zoom, FaceTime, TikTok, you name it. Isolated in our imposed cubicles, we languished. We didn't want to be alone. Some were able to keep in contact with family and friends. Some actually turned to the church, albeit virtually, well, at least at first. Some just wandered around in their thoughts, going wherever their minds led them. And did I mention that even when we're alone, away from other people, we're really not? In our hearts and minds, there's always a small, still voice of something, of someone. And too often, it is the whispers of the evil one, prompting the doubts and the despairs that ultimately lead to depression and despondency. Did God really say was his opening line to Eve, which made her to contemplate and then subsequently doubt what God had really said? which then also led her to fall prey to his temptation to be like God, and which wound up introducing death into the creation story. 
Now, the devil can't make things happen. He doesn't have that kind of power. And the devil can't make us respond. We're not puppets in his hands. But the devil can whisper in our ear, meddle with our minds, deceive us with his lies, misdirect us in his living, which he does a lot. That's why Paul cautions us, saying, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The devil goes for the mind, because that's the only thing he can sway, your thoughts, your thinking. Now, maybe you can see what I said, that even when you're not around other people, you're still never alone. Either God or Satan is going to be there with you. St. Paul in our text for this morning prays that we realize God doesn't want us to be alone. In the previous verses, Paul spoke of the mystery of the gospel. That the grace and love of God are meant for everyone, Jews and Gentiles alike. And it is this good news that Paul has shared with the Ephesians to know and to cherish. That no one is left out of God's covenant. Which goes like this, I will be their God and they all will be my people. In God's plan, no one is to be alone. And so the apostle here prays. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. Who's included? Every family in heaven and earth? Well, that pretty well covers the whole of humankind, right? He doesn't pray just for the families of believers, or people on the right side of politics, or social standing, or even religion, the things that we will tend to allow or even make use of in order to divide us. Paul prays for everyone. Paul prays for me. He prays for you. In God's heart, no one is left out. And what does Paul pray for? Well, that's what the rest of our text this morning speaks to. The strengthening of our inner being. The indwelling of Christ in our hearts through faith. And our being founded on the selfless, serving, sacrificial love that Christ demonstrates on the cross. All in order that we might comprehend and hold fast to the fullness of God. He says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. What we forget is that the Holy Spirit is not some detached, ghostly presence just floating around, but a real comforter and counselor that God sends to believers. Jesus promised us before his crucifixion, death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven that I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit comes through God's means of grace, word, sacraments. The Bible speaks of the spirits working in us, telling us, for instance, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, and the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. The Spirit comes to us according to the riches of God's glory. Why? So that God may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being. The Spirit is connecting God to you and you to him. And how strong is that connection going to be? As strong as your presence among the God's word and sacraments. Think of it this way. A beautiful lamp shines its light only if it's plugged into a wall socket. No bulb, no electricity. It may be pretty to look, like, look at, but it is useless in lighting up the space. Well, you and I are called by Christ to be the light of the world which is kind of hard for us to be and to do if we have no wick, no flame, no bulb, no power. The Spirit strengthens us power. Why? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. The Bible explains this as we read Paul's words to the Corinthians where he tells them, the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually Discerned. Once again, understanding that it is the Holy Spirit 
who connects us to God. It is the Spirit's work to bring us to Christ Jesus the Savior in order that Jesus may dwell in our hearts. Faith is the result of God's working in us by the Holy Spirit. Even as Paul says to the Ephesians and tells them that by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The Spirit strengthens our faith, our bond with Jesus, who graciously then takes up residence in our inner being, in order that we might be a part of His forever family for all of eternity. The Spirit strengthens us with power, so that Jesus dwells in us by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. With the indwelling of Christ in our hearts, by the working of the Holy Spirit, we are rooted like an old, old oak tree, and grounded like a house built on a strong foundation, but not in Florida, in love. This love, this love of Christ is God's kind of love, agape love, selfless, serving, sacrificial love. It's a love that simply exists for the sake of the other person. It's not conditioned upon what or who the other person does or is. It is unconditionally given despite how or even if the recipient receives it or rejects it. Agape love is the love God chose to show to and share with the sinful children of men. St. John describes this love, saying, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loves us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And such love surpasses knowledge. Which means that our relationship is not built on knowing about God, that is, head knowledge, but by being loved by God, which enables us then to be filled with all the fullness of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit chooses to live among us, with us, even in us, both here in time and there in eternity, to quote Luther. Hence, we're not alone. I'm not alone. For as I hear God's word and celebrate his sacraments, the Spirit enters my inner being so that Christ dwells in me and works his grace in me. You are not alone, for this same Holy Spirit comes to you in God's means of grace to work faith, to connect you to the cross of Jesus, to encourage you in God's love to be filled with his fullness. Folks, we're not alone. We have God's Spirit who strengthens our faith and empowers our hope. So I close with the last words of today's epistle reading, which serve as an acknowledgement of and a thanksgiving for the grace of God. Paul writes, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.